Um, so today, the first talk we're going to have is from David Wenger. Uh, he is a developer at Microsoft. And here he is. Hi, Dave. G'day, Will. How's it going? <laughs> going very well. I'm, I'm always impressed by that uh, Lego collection you have in the background there, Dave. <laughs> ever growing. Do you, do you ever just pick one off the shelf and take it apart and rebuild it? Or they just build ones, leave it forever? Uh, Sometimes they fall off the shelves and get rebuilt, but uh, usually I try to be nice. My kids, not so much. <laughs> um, now, I mean, same, I love Lego. Uh, do you find that, uh, you know, Lego sort of helps you take a break from programming, but still keep your mind active in a sort of way of uh, you know, programming in a way, like nice and procedural, there's always instructions? Yes. Or do you just like building random things? No, I'm definitely not the random builder. Uh, I leave that to the kids. I'm definitely uh, follow the instructions. And uh, I like to, uh, so, you know, there's cars and stuff behind me. I like cars. Um, what I like about it is as you're putting it together, you can see some of, you're seeing how it works and how it fits together. And then, of course, it's uh, it's greater than its parts kind of thing. Uh, that's mm. the same thing I like about programming. So there's definitely parallels. Now, you are talking to us today about records, but I'm assuming it's not the old uh, music records. There's something uh, very different. Uh, C-sharp records, right? That's right. Yep. And uh, so can you maybe just give us a hint uh, before we start? Why would I choose to use records over classes and structs, for instance? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's kind of, you know, maybe what I'm going to answer, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think I think the uh, Scott kind of I won't say he stole a line from me because I'm pretty sure I stole it from him, but I have used it before in talks uh, when he was talking about looking, you know, one level below what you understand. Um, I love that idea. That's what I do as well. And that's sort mm. of how I approach uh, records. So for me, it's not so much about when you would use a record or a struct or a class. It's what's more important is to uh, understand what a record is mm -hmm. under the covers so that you can make that decision because it's always going to be you know dependent on what you're doing uh, i'm looking forward to this dave because uh uh I, i've got questions of my own about records for you but uh, i'll leave that till the end i think uh we'll go through your talk so uh the stream is yours take it away all right thank you no pressure following uh that wonderful keynote. But uh, hello, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name's Dave. Let's talk about records. What is a record? Uh, that's a tough question that I don't know the answer to because, well, I didn't prepare for this talk at all. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, a record is a funny thing to define because in C Sharp 9, a record is another way of defining a type. Uh, but in C Sharp 10, even that statement is not true. And a record is now just a thing. Uh, and it's another way to define a thing. But it's not really its own thing. And um, what I think a record is, and this is a very well led to by William's question, which was completely unscripted, I promise, uh, is a record is really just the collection of its parts, right? It's, it's all the bits of a record put together. That's what define it. And I've sort of put six uh, of those features, I guess, uh, on the screen there. To me, this is what defines a record. It's just a record has these uh, has these qualities, essentially. Um, what's interesting about records or about these qualities is that five of these, which I have circled with a squiggly square, are not exclusive to records. And so, like I was saying before, one of the really cool things about records is even if you're never going to use them, by understanding how they work and understanding what the compiler does to achieve uh, recordness, um, you can bring some of those concepts to your existing code, even if you don't use records, or maybe you will use records, or maybe you use records and you'll take some of them out. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Uh, and I'm just going to barrel through. Here we go. Um, so the first one up is simplified declaration. And as of right now, uh, and including C Sharp 10, which is coming out in November, um, this is exclusive to records. The only way to get this uh, simplified syntax is to use a record. You can't put it on your own classes and things. There's lots of requests for that, but you can't at the moment. Um, and what this essentially is, is, well, I mean, you can see there, right? It's a one-line declaration. 
it kind of looks like a type declaration because it's public something car, right? It's not a return type, it's a thing. It kind of looks like a constructor because, again, it doesn't have a return type, but it does have brackets and parameters, so it kind of looks like a method call, right? So it kind of looks like a constructor, and it kind of looks like a type declaration, and it turns out it's kind of those things in one. That numdoors uh, parameter there explodes out and becomes a parameter of the constructor and a property of the class that this would generate. And that's really what a record is. At the end of the day, a record is a different way of defining a class. And it has some other behaviors, but that's kind of what it is. Um, now, full disclosure, if you know what records are and how they work, uh, that's a lie. It's not a set. We'll talk about that later. And there's a lot more that gets uh, generated with records. It's not just uh, one constructor. But we'll cover all of that. Um, but simplified declaration is, uh, for me, the sort of the quintessential thing about a record. I love that you can define a class in one line and use it and it has properties and it does what you need it to do. It's really good for you know data transfer objects, those sort of things, those small classes. Um, I just have you know a file and put 20 records definitions in, it's 20 lines and you're done. Um, so it's really nice and if nothing else, uh, it it's, was well, probably one of my favorite or second favorite feature of them, um, even though it's arguably the least interesting. Um, but that's what a record is, essentially. So let's get going. Uh, I said that records was a class, and in C Sharp 9, that's true. In C Sharp 10, that's not true. So what you can now do, or well, now if you're using preview versions of VS and in future, um, is you can actually tell the compiler what type of thing you want this record to be. So you can say public record class car, and that will generate a class. And of course, if you can say class, well, then you can say struct, and that'll generate a struct. And this is also why records aren't really anything, because a record is just a class or a struct. It's not a new kind of type in .NET, um, which it seems like it is at first, but it's not. It's just the features, you know. Um, I just saw Melissa's question about David's room, and I thought she was talking about Lego. Uh, yes, if you ask questions on Slido, that's what that QR code recorder is for. Um, OK, so immutable. Back to records. Uh, records are immutable by default. Um, someone, uh, th there's many people who disagree with that statement. Uh, there's often, uh, I won't say heated debates, but there's discussions about this concept. Uh, there's some in GitHub on like the docs page where it says they're immutable by default and people complain that they're not. Uh, on C Sharp Discord, hello everyone on C Sharp Discord. Uh, I say things like, yeah, they're immutable by default and everyone says, no, they're not. Immutable is controversial. So let me let me talk about this. When I say by default, what I mean is that simplified declaration of a record, right? this one-liner. If you define a record in one line like that, then it is an immutable object, guaranteed. The problem with immutability in records is you can't essentially know whether a record is immutable or not. There is nothing by definition that says it's immutable. So this record definition, right, single line, this is immutable. This record definition is exactly the same, but it is not immutable. And from a consuming point of view, you can't tell. Obviously, you can look at the source code and tell. If you can look at the source code, well, that answers all the questions, right? But if you are given uh, an instance of type car and someone tells you it's a record, that doesn't mean anything, right? This record down the bottom there is a mutable record because it has a set uh, accessor on that property. You can set that whenever you like. So as I lied to you earlier, that's not how the C-sharp compiler generates a record. What it actually generates is an init accessor. So this is a new thing added in C-sharp 9 for records, um, but it works on any property. It works on structs, it works on classes. And what it does is it allows you to define a mutable, sorry, an immutable type, so one where you can't set properties, or the init properties anyway, except you can set them in if you're initializing an object. And there's essentially two ways to initialize an object in C Sharp. Uh, number one is the constructor. Whoops, that's the constructor there on the screen. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, right, in the constructor there, we're setting this numdoors property but well, we've said we can't set it, so how does that work? Well, the compiler knows that, okay, in the constructor, you can call an init property. 
And it is very specifically in the constructor. You can't set an init property in a method, even if the method is called from the constructor, like it is specific. The other initialization case, which I skipped to earlier, is object initialization. So pretend we didn't have the constructor. You can construct an object in C-sharp like this. You just specify those properties and C-sharp will let you, the compiler will let you, even though you're setting a property because you're initializing the um, initializing an object. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, they did. Uh, if you try and set the property the normal way, then you get an error because the compiler cannot know or doesn't know that you're initializing an object, kind of. Like, I mean, you look at that and you're like, well, obviously they am, but you don't get what I mean. Um, so let's, let's, let's just dig into that because fine, that's immutability. It's easy to say, yes, there's an internet accessor. But the interesting thing comes, as I said, from knowing why. So this is SharpLab. Uh, if you haven't seen SharpLab before, SharpLab is an amazing tool. It's a website uh, written by a lovely man just across the pond in New Zealand. And what it does is as I type out code over here, uh, which I will do right now, it is compiling my code into IL. And then it is uh, using, sorry, using the latest bits of Roslyn, so C Sharp 10 essentially. And then it is decompiling my code, but it is telling IL Spy, which is the decompiler, it's saying, hey, I wrote this code with C Sharp 1. So none of these features uh, are sort of available to IL Spy as it's decompiling. So if we look at this record I've just defined, what it does is it explodes out to, well, here's our class car, and there's a bunch of stuff. Here's our backing field for our property. Here's our property. And we can see it has an init accessor. Right. That's cool. Doesn't really tell us much, but okay. Um, if I create a variable, of this type, uh, I can, this is a bit weird, but I can set the property, even though it's also set in the constructor. Uh, you wouldn't want to do it, but you can. Uh, but you can see here, this is my object initializer, right? This is what it compiles to. It compiles to create a car and then set the numdos property. The compiler is allowed to do this because it's the compiler, it knows, right? It trusts itself. If I paste this over here, I'm going to get an, uh, an error. So this is the compiler enforcing, hey, you've got an init property here, right? It says here, you can't just do this. So how does an init property work? Well, if we switch to IL, which is very scary, scary and I don't like doing, so I won't do it again. But if we have a look at what this really generates, uh, and actually, you know what? I'm going to change this because it's too scary for me. I'm just going to make this a, uh, what did I say, numdoors. I'm going to do it the old fashioned way on a class, which means I now need to get rid of that. So this is a class with an init property. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back to the C sharp just to prove there's no magic here. So this is just got a field property in an accessor. We'll get rid of all that record junk. If we go down the bottom, here's our properties. Here's a property called numdoors, it's an int. Now properties, if you didn't know, they're really just get and set methods under the hood. So our get says get numdoors and our set is set numdoors. So in IL, right, in a .NET DLL, there's no such thing as init. It's a C-sharp compiler thing. Uh, and init is really just a set with a hat on. And this is the hat. Uh, it's a mod rec. I have no idea what that means. And it basically annotates it with this type. And then the compiler knows, hey, if something is annotated with this type, it's an init property. And so it doesn't let you set it. So why is this interesting? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, firstly, you can use init properties in your normal classes, right? You don't need to use records to get this feature. That's pretty cool. Uh, number two, this type is defined in uh, .NET, right? It's in .NET Core, I don't know, 3.1 or whatever. If you're not targeting .NET 3.1, you can't use init properties. Uh, you get an error that says, hey, there is no type called is external init. And you look at that and you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Well, it turns out if you work out what the compiler does, you can do this and go public static class is external init. And uh, I'm going to get really IL, it's confusing me. Um, if you do that, <coughs> actually, no, I'm not. If you do this, you can use init properties. If we look down at our property here, you can see our mod rec. Now, if you were keen eyed, this is actually slightly different. Before, this said, system private call lib in front of it, right? That's where the type came from. Now the type is coming from our assembly. 
So we've just essentially put in part of the runtime and uh, you know now we can use init properties everywhere. It is a little bit tricky in that you want to be careful making this public because if you've got something consuming you that targets 3.1 or whatever, but good question. Um, Graham, good question. Can you get a property by reflection set it? Yes. So this is the the asterisks here for immutability in C Sharp. Uh, C Sharp loves backwards compatibility. In fact, so does all of Microsoft. <clears throat> so we don't like breaking people. So as you can see, this is a set in IL. This is still called set numdos. You can set this in reflection. Uh, a, now the good thing about that is it means that a deserializer will still be able to set it. So you can use a record or you can have a class with an init property. And if you're deserializing it from JSON or whatever, that's cool. Your init properties still work. They can still be set by the decompiler, but also your immutability still works. Uh, and so you know that, you know, no one else can change this property, which is cool. So the one uh, drawback, if you like, to init properties, or not, not drawback, but there's a bit of a gap still within a properties, which hopefully will be fixed in future. Uh, and that is around nullability. So if I define a class and I have a nullable string address, then fine, we can make that init property. You can only set it during initialization uh, and that's it, it's great. But if I define a non-nullable string and I don't have a constructor, then I get an error because nothing is initializing this property, which means its default value is null, but you've said it's not nullable but you don't want to initialize it because you want the people to initialize it and they can't set it. Like, so it's it's all very, these kind of features kind of bump into each other. And there's a few ways around it. You can just have a constructor. And I mean, that makes sense, right? If everyone has to set a name, then have it in your constructor, right? The other way around it, if you're sure that someone is going to set the name, like for example, if you know your code and you know for sure this is only ever going to be used when deserializing um, you know, some input, then you can sort of work around the issue. So one way is to assign it to null and then use the exclamation mark, which is the null forgiveness operator, which is the compiler shut up and get out of my way operator. Um, and this will work. And this just says, yeah, look, okay, fine. I've initialized it. Don't worry, someone will follow up later. Um, and obviously you could just make it nullable as well, but that's a bit annoying because then you've got to you know, check for nulls all the time. So what's coming in C Sharp 11, <laughs> It, it, it recently got cut from C Sharp 10, sadly, um, is required properties. And I mention this because this is just going to make everything so much nicer and it's really going to fill in the, the sort of the, the complete picture here. So within it properties, I can say this can only be set during initialization, can't set it anywhere else. With required, I can say this has to be set during initialization. Um, and so that really completes the picture. And then you can really create classes that you can control how they're used. Uh, fully. When would I use an init property over a record? Uh, I will leave that question till the last slide. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Um, value semantics. So value semantics is the next property we're going to talk about. Next property. Shouldn't use property. Can't, it's really hard to talk about types and kinds and classes and objects. Uh, value semantics is the next feature we're going to talk about. Uh, what is value semantics? Good question. Uh, what does this code do, right? What is result? Is it true or false, right? Who knows? No way of knowing. Um, value semantics or sem the semantics that we're talking about here is what does it mean for one thing to be equal to another thing? I'm going to switch to uh, Visual Studio for this one, which is over here. So uh, feel free to yell at me, producers, if I need to zoom. I will, in fact, a little bit. There we go. So I have a different type of record here called the point. And uh, I'm constructing a point. It's got two properties, X and Y, right? Pretty boring. Uh, I'm actually going to make another point, though. And I'm going to set it to the same, the same values. And then when I do equals here, uh, so it does P1 equal P2. And I run my code, and I look for the console window. Hello, console window. There it is. That's not the right one. Um, Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, that took a while. So yes, what can I say? Um, so that output's true, right? Those two points are equal because they point to the same point. If I change one, it's now false. Great, makes sense. If I make this a class, not a class, but a class, and I run this, it's still false, right? So 
why isn't this why was it true with a record and why was it false with the class well that's value semantics so records have no sense of equality of themselves they they sort of pass that on to their constituent parts um, the real answer here is that um, for a class the default equals does uh, p, p1 p2 so the, the default uh, equality for a class is reference equality which means is this literally the exact same instance right so what a record does is it does value equality the value equality means yeah these represent the same thing they're still not the exact same instance right that second check still returns false but they mean the same thing now if you've used uh, structs before structs also have value equality so and this is another thing where records get weird right what's a record well it's a class well except it can be a struct what's cool about records they have value equality but so do structs but records can be structs so they already have it it's kind of weird um, and this is kind of why I didn't want to answer the when would you use question because it's it depends so if a struct has value equality I can achieve value equality now great uh, if a record has value equality, I can use that to get it. What about a class? Well, it turns out you can achieve value equality very easily. You can just override the equals method here, and I can say return. Now I get to type on camera uh, while making lots of mistakes. Uh, and p dot x equals x. I'm just going to describe. Oh, look, thank you, IntelliCode. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. We compile. Oh, I missed equals. No one in the chat is yelling at equals. I'm shocked. So I've just made this class have value equality. So what's so good about records, right? Like this is where you have to uh, you have to pick and choose what you're using. Why would you want to do it? Well, so value equality is really good in some circumstances. For example, a point class. It's pretty uh, well. I won't say obvious, but it, it might be common that uh, we don't care what instance is what, we just care where is this point in physical space. And so that's what value equality provides, right? And so you can achieve all these things, but again, it's just a cool thing to know. So now the question becomes, or rather, uh, back to here. Whoops, nope, wrong one. There we go. So value semantics. So classes have reference equality, but you can implement value equality if you want. Structs have value equality. Records act like structs, which is good. So why would you use records? Well, it turns out records are better at being structs than structs are. Um, so this uh, is a benchmark.net output thingy. Um, and so this is just calling the equals method. And a record, uh, the equals method take, took 20 nanoseconds. I think this had two int properties. It was basically the point class I had. Um, and a struct took 340 nanoseconds. Now, that's a very short amount of time. Um, and 104 bytes allocated is not a lot of memory, but sometimes people can uh, care about these things. Um, and if you do, you might want to choose a record. So how is this speed achieved? Well, for that, we have to go back to Sharp Lab and we go back to making this a record and we go back to C Sharp and we look at the equals method. The equals method in a record is right here and it does a bunch of rubbish, but essentially it does what I did in my class. It says, hey, are these two fields uh, equal? And if I, in fact, add another field here, uh, private int underscore new field, we will see in the equals method, um, at the end, at the start, there it is. Nope, that's get hash code, sorry. There it is. We will see that it is including new field in its uh, in its equality check. So a record will generate an equals method that checks every single field. And that's how it does e equality, right? So it's the constituent parts. A struct, on the other hand, and if we look at the source of .NET, we can find this out. So all structs inherit from value type, uh, which is confusingly a class, but ignore that. Value types equals method happens to be at the top of the file, which is very convenient for me. Um, and if we look at what it does, we get to this line, and if you know what this line is, you'll know why it's slower, right? This is reflection. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense. A struct at runtime has to work out, right, what fields do they have? Okay, let me loop through them. And, and you know, this, this gets the value of both fields and checks the equals. Like, it's the same logic, 
but this is happening at runtime, working out which fields you've got. This is happening at compile time, generating an equals method. So records are sort of, I won't say they're cheating um, because they're not, but they're a form of code generation. And if you've looked into source generators, and if you know me, you know that I love source generators, um, that's one of the advantages, right? Is they can look at your code and they can do things and therefore you can get faster results. And with expressions, uh, this is good, we're banging through them. Hopefully there's lots of questions waiting for me. Maybe please ask questions. Um, all right, with expressions. So uh, here I am defining two cars. A Honda S2000 is a car with two doors and a Honda Accord Euro is basically the same as a Honda S2000, but with four doors. Uh, now, if you know cars, you now know what car I drive. It's not the convertible. Um, so uh, what am I doing here? Like, what, what is this new with rubbish? Um, so what this is doing is this is, now firstly, it's setting a uh, setting a property, which, well, hang on, isn't that illegal because of init uh, properties? Well, it is, but this is another form of uh, initializing types. And well, it's kind of the same form. This is like an object expression, but with some other stuff. But so what this is doing is saying, hey, here's an instance of a car, Honda S2000, take that, make a copy of it, and give me a new one, but set the num doors to four. So it's still initializing our Honda Accord Euro object. It's just that as part of that initialization, we're gonna get most of it from uh, the existing object, right? So let's go back to here and we'll zoom the browser as requested. Sorry for not noticing earlier. Um, so what are we gonna do? So here we go, so we have a car, we have a thing, and I'm just going to see with, oops, with num doors. Now this one is a very silly example because car only has one property, but let's just have a look how it works anyway. Uh, scroll down, here it is. So this is our with expression. Now it's not very clear and you just have to trust me on that, but it is. Um, the way a with expression works is a little bit more compiler magic where the compiler gets to cheat. So you're not allowed to set the num doors property in your code, but the compiler can set it in its code because you know it's the compiler, right? So what the compiler does is it makes a copy of the car and then it sets the property and then it gives you back the car you wanted. Now, these variable names get confusing. That's because the decompilation doesn't know your variable names. Um, but so it calls this weird clone method, right? Now, so <laughs> I did this before and I'll do, I'll do it again. If we copy the code to here, you'll find this is illegal code, besides the fact that the car doesn't exist. Um, not only because we're setting the property, which is this error, but the name clone doesn't exist, and there's an end of file expected, and things just get weird. And that's because of this, I mean, right? This is not C sharp code. Mm -hmm. So what is this nonsense? This is what is referred to as an unspeakable method. So this is a method that is valid in IL as a name, but it's not valid in C sharp. And so the compiler uses this all the time to generate things that it doesn't want people to call. In fact, you can see it right here in the backing field. It's the same thing. The backing field of a property is unspeakable because the compiler doesn't want anyone to be able to get at it. So why don't we want people to get at the clone method? Well, in order to maintain immutability, we have to know that there is a way to make a 100% accurate copy of this instance, right? Uh, we have, if, if, the, if the act of copying changes something, then that breaks immutability. So the clone method uh, is down here. It doesn't look very interesting. It just calls this constructor. Here's the constructor. It just sets fields. Uh, in fact, again, if I can, I can add a field here as well. Uh, yep, a loop. Uh, you'll see the the new field is here as well. So again, all fields get uh, generated into this. But so this, what this means is that there is a, a way the compiler trusts to clone a record. And as soon as it knows, well, okay, if I can make a faithful copy and that means I can set some properties and that means I can sort of maintain immutability but allow for it's not really modification because it's always copying, but it allow for, uh, I guess, deriving new instances. And so that's what with expressions do. 
Uh, so the other thing with with expressions, oh, this is just, I love this. Um, you can nest them and it makes for really expressive code. So this is actually from my uh, train game. Um, it draws a bunch of stuff on the screen. So I have a background and when you mouse over things, I want to hover them. So I can define the hover background and saying, hey, the hover background is the same as the background. It just has a different color. And so then whatever I do to the background, I know hover background will sort of inherit it, right? It's not inheritance, but you know what I mean. Um, and same thing with the colors, right? I want light blue, but I want an alpha of 85%. Um, so it's really nice syntax once you get to use it. Um, with expressions are not exclusive to records, but they are exclusive to things the compiler knows it can copy. So in C sharp nine, that means records. And in C sharp 10, that means record structs. In C sharp 10, it's also going to be available on every struct, which is pretty cool. So every struct you might have out there, you can now use with expressions and anonymous types. So anonymous types is another one of these things where the compiler generates code. And since the compiler generates all of the code for them, it knows it can make a faithful copy. Um, if we look, uh, let me make a new anonymous type quickly. Oops, there we go. So the anonymous type, here it is, unspeakable names again, right? Um, the anonymous type doesn't have anything interesting. It has an equals method, it has a two string, like there's nothing here to clone, but because the compiler generates, well, essentially all of this code, but it generates this constructor, the compiler is going to, uh, when you use a with expression, it'll just call the constructor of this type, pass in all of the properties from the existing one, except for whatever you set on here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't demo this because um, it's version uh, T with, I don't think Sharplab, uh, this version, this branch is up to date. No. And unfortunately, the, ma the master build of uh, Rawson is currently failing and um, it's not my fault. All right, so that's with expressions. Fully customizable. So this is the last, my, my last point. Uh, we're doing well for time. Uh, they're fully customizable. And so I'm just going to go back to here. We've actually seen this already, uh, and we've seen this in basically every demo I've done. Uh, let me get rid of all this stuff. In fact, here, look, I'm customizing a record. Um, that sometimes gets confused. There we go. Um, what the compiler does is it wants to generate a bunch of code for your record. Uh, it wants to generate a property. And what it does is for everything that it's going to generate, it checks whether you have first. So here, it would want to generate this numdoors property. Sorry, no, it won't. Wait a minute. Now it wants to generate a numdoors property, but I got there first, so it's not going to. So if I comment out my property, here's a numdoors property we get. If I don't comment out my property, well, we still get it, but this is mine. Now you can't tell because I've done it the same way, but if I change this to a set, and now this numdoors property has a set. And so this is true of every part of a record. So if you want to change how a record two string is uh, done, you can just, oops, you can just do this and you can go, oops, you see, and now when we look at the generated code for a record, the two string method says return in DC. So you can take the bits of the record you want and if you want to change them, then you just change them. What this means is uh, you can take this equals method and you can put it here and you can return false. And now you don't have value equality anymore, right? Um, and so this is, I mean, you probably wouldn't do that. Please don't, right? But this is where records, again, they get kind of weird, right? A record could be a one line declaration that does everything for you, or you could have a 3000 line file that has methods and properties and fields and whatever else. Any fields you define, the compiler will put in your equals method. Any uh, properties, the backing fields are going, right? So you can customize as much as you like. And so that goes back to the question of, you know, when should I use a property and method? Well, see, uh, and what is a record, right? A record is anything you like. It can be immutable. And some would argue that it's immutable by default, but it's also not necessarily. It can be really simple to declare, or you can declare it in a really long, verbose way. Um, it can have value semantics, or it cannot, right? So what I like about a record 
is that I get to look at how the compiler team at Microsoft who writes C-sharp think a immutable class should be written. And so I get to look at the get hash code method and go, oh, what does this do? How does this work? Um, more importantly, I get to not write a get hash code method because I'm not smart enough and I don't want my dictionaries to break, right? Um, I get to take advantage of the things from a record that I want, but not get the things that I don't want. On this though, I strongly recommend if you're going to do this, that you uh, invest in uh, using Sharplab to, uh, to have a look at what's going on. And I'll give you an example of why. Uh, let's just make, we're going to make this a record. It's going to have an, an X and a Y. Uh, and we're going to, I, I don't know, let, let's just, we'll, we'll define one property and we'll let the compiler define the other and we'll try to correctly use a cursor. So we have a, we have a point, it's got two properties, great. I'm initializing it to one and two, great. So what should this output? You would think that it should output one and two and it's just building and it's gonna be really slow. Oh, there it is. But it outputs one and zero. So why is that? So the danger of customizing is that the compiler might be doing things you don't know. In this case, uh, it's because I never set this property. Now it's gonna be one and two. Right, so if you're going to customize it, please be careful. <laughs> but uh, you can. So it's kind of nice, but it also you know can be a trap. Um, the compiler does tell you here. There's a little green squiggle, and it says uh, that parameter y is unread. So that's nice. Um, it just it, it means that the the you shouldn't necessarily assume <laughs> maybe that uh, things are going to keep working the way you want, which is, again, that's, you know, that's why I said you can't tell a record is immutable. Well, in this case, here's a record with two properties. You can't tell whether the one is used or not. Right? And I can't set this, so this record's just fundamentally broken. This Y can never be anything but zero. That's not a good thing. Um, but anyway, whoops, hello, you're still on the screen. Oh, wait. Yes, so records can be anything, but what's sort of important is that you look that one level let that one level below what's going on and therefore you'll know what's going on and but you can take those bits you can take the bits you want use them in a class use them in a, in a struct uh you know change your existing code maybe i don't know it's up to you um and with that hopefully someone has some questions because i am done but i'm pretty good for time Oh, it's just me. Hello. Uh, I have. <laughs> That's fascinating, Dave. There's uh, a whole lot to learn about the, the C Sharp compiler and, and records there. Um, and we do have some interesting questions, actually. The first one comes from uh, Aaron Powell. And he's asking, when would I use an init property over a record? Yeah. I mean, essentially, this is up to which bits do you want? If you only want init properties, then you probably just want to use one. And if you want init properties and some of the other stuff records provide, then use records. And my dog agrees. Um, <laughs> you, um, yeah, it, it really just is a matter of, I mean, essentially, you know, write, write down the pros and cons and pick which column has the more things. And it's very much case by case. Mm, so, mm. No, that's fair. cool. So the next question is from Harry asking, how does inheritance work with records? That's, that's, for me, that's an interesting question as well. What do you think? Yeah, so so inheritance is is uh, it's I didn't get into it because it makes the code well it doesn't make the code harder to understand but some of the features of records are the way they are because of inheritance so things like the clone method and things like if you noticed when there was a two string method it called something called print members that is there to support inheritance and so if I have a record mm -hmm. that inherits from another record, then the two string of the outer one will call print members on itself and then print members on the inner one, not two string on the inner one. So that the output looks better. So there's a bunch of things around like, yeah, with clone, especially like with immutability where they, the code they generate is specifically to handle inheritance. So the mm -hmm. answer to the question is it works totally fine. Um, you can't <laughs> inherit 
you can't inherit a class from a record or a record from a class though so, well, maybe you can have a record. so you always have no, to you can't. Oh, okay it's record always to record. inherit from a record yes it's exclusive and again that's because of those immutability guarantees right if you could inherit mm -hmm. from a class then that base class would do anything you want so um, the next question from Graham. Graham, I think you've already answered that question before. Uh, can you get a property by reflection and set it? Uh, yeah, so, so none, of this, none of this stuff is really sort of runtime. Um, hmm. Like, there were, yeah, there is a slight change to the runtime for records, which is that is external init type. But yeah, at the end of the day, these classes are just plain old .NET classes. You can set properties. But then that's also true with private setters and private fields and private properties. So that's sort of not you know that's not new right read only fields same thing mm -hmm. reflection right yeah you can do what you want <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but i think you know in some ways use records because you sort of would prefer the, the generated code it's, it's like you said uh, or showed the one benchmark it's a, a lot more optimal to use the generated yep. code it's smarter you know it's, it's real code um yep mm. cool so that sort of segues in the next question uh, when we combine records with the with keyword. <laughs> mm. um, and if you have a, a complex record, for instance, it has a, a dictionary or a, an I list to a collection, and, and you then, you know, with that, add another value to that record. Does that complicated type or complex type get cloned exactly correctly? Yeah, so this is, this is uh, yes, it, uh, sorry, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> this is where records get uh, a little bit hairy. And in fact, so do structs, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's no deep cloning ability. Like there's nothing baked into .NET, right? The, if there was, the compiler wouldn't have had to generate that clone method. So there is no way to know, essentially know how to clone a dictionary, right? We can say, I know mm. how to clone a dictionary because we understand what the dictionary that's in the framework happens to do, but there's no guarantees. You know, someone else mm. could write a dictionary that does something different. So... Mm. No, you're not going to get a deep clone. You're not going to get an exact copy like that. So, you know, you essentially are copying a pointer to the same dictionary across to the new instance. Um, so you mm. do need to be careful of that. You know, you can't mm. get immutability out of mutable things. Um, that's, you know, that's just life, essentially. Uh, this isn't <laughs> going to reinvent the world. Um, mm -hmm. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't suggest going and changing all of your classes to records just because you want to. You know, I don't know. I don't know why you would anyway. But uh, you probably get the power. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you do need to be a little bit careful. Um, they mm. are. I mean, the value equality thing is. It's, the, you know, what is the value of a dictionary, right? A, a val when you compare two dictionaries, it doesn't compare every element. It doesn't, right? I think, and I think as .NET developers, we sort of understand that that that's different and so when you think mm. about well how would that work with value equality well the answer is it doesn't right which mm. i think makes sense but maybe not. so to so give a recommendation is if you had a record uh with you know, arrays for instance just a, a, a simple array or something very basic rather than a, a dictionary that cloning would be more guaranteed or more you know, correct yeah definitely if you i mean so this is sort of not yeah, I guess not relevant to records really at all, but essentially if you're going for immutability, immutability everything has to be immutable from the ground up. Like you, mm, you just mm. have to. And, and you certainly can achieve immutability without records, like the init accessor helps, but I mean, you can do it traditional ways, right? With constructors and private setters. Uh, you don't get a with expression, but you can make with methods that do the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating, David. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've all got a fair bit to <laughs> take away and uh, learn from your talk. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much.